we've been in Psalm 103 for several weeks, and this today we'll finish the psalm. It's just such a wonderful uh, expression of of uh, who God is, and we'll learn a little bit more about uh, what God has said about Himself this morning. You know, it's very difficult for us to grasp the infinite. This morning I want to explore the, that part of God's nature that talks about how He is eternal, from everlasting to everlasting. I found this story, it's, it's perhaps a legend about St. Augustine, which illustrates our limitations. It was around the year 415, and St. Augustine was walking along the beach on a sunny, bright day, but he was frustrated. He was taking a break for working on what has become one of his greatest doctrinal contributions to the church on the Trinity. The subject matter had left him bleary eyed in need of fresh air. It's at this moment, as the frothy tide rushed out, that a little boy caught St. Augustine's eye. The freckle-faced child had a determined, furrowed brow. He was clearly up to something, running back and forth, back and forth, between the sea and a tiny hole in the sand. My son, St. Augustine called, or Augustine called over the crashing waves, what are you doing there? The little boy held up a pink shell he was using to move water. I'm trying to fit that great big ocean into this little tiny hole. St. Augustine smiled, charmed by his innocence, by the child's innocence, his bright eyes, the way sunlight shone in his curly hair. He then followed the boy to kneel beside the tiny hole, watching him spill out a few meager drops. My child, the Bishop of Hippos, broke the news gently turning the boy's skinny shoulders to face the sea. He then spread his whole arms wide. You could never fit this great, magnificent ocean into that tiny hole. The child didn't flinch, but responded quickly, and you could never possibly understand the Holy Trinity. You know, there are many things about God which are beyond our ability to understand. Our minds are like that hole in the sand. And to understand the infinite is like trying to place the ocean in that little hole in the sand. Job was asked the question, can you discover the depths of God? Can you discover the limits of the Almighty? David Jeremiah in discussing the eternity of God has said this, a God that is small enough to be understood isn't big enough to be worshipped. God, by definition, must be infinitely great. If you have a God who can grasp, he ceases to be God. By definition, God must be incomprehensible. If we could unravel the mysteries of his person, we would elevate ourselves to his level, which we cannot. Psalm 103 makes a reference to our God who is from everlasting to everlasting. And this comparison or this, this concept occurs in a comparison between the temporary nature of man and the eternal nature of God. So turn to Psalm 103. We'll begin at verse 15. As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. When the wind has passed over it, it is no more. And its place acknowledges it no longer. The idea that our earthly life is short and fragile is often repeated in Scripture. Isaiah 40, verse 6 through 8 says, All flesh is grass. Its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fadeth. When the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, 
but the word of God stands forever. Isaiah is echoing the thought here of the King David in this psalm. Man's time on earth is temporary. But by contrast, God and his word is eternal. His mercy and his righteousness remain forever. So we can always count on them. God blesses us with Christian leaders, with mentors, with preachers, with teachers, with parents, but they pass away. Can't help us. But God remains. He alone is always available. You know, the cycle of grass greening up and and in the spring and then fading in the hot summer winds is a common sight here in central Kansas. Likewise, we observe flowers blooming and for a while then they fade. I've noticed that some of my flowers and things in my garden are starting to look kind of sad. I can fertilize them, I can water them, I can deadhead the flowers, but I'm kind of delaying the inevitable. Because flowers fade, grass dries up. We're like dust, as the psalmist has said in these verses before this. Our days are like the withering grass. And this passage in verses 15 and 16 is often used in funerals. How that we are, life is short. But you know, there's very little comfort in the confirmation that life is short and fading unless we continue on with verse 17. Look at verse 17. It says, But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear Him. So if God's loving kindness is eternal, <coughs> His covenantal love is eternal, it has to have an object. And that object is those who trust in Him. There's very little in the Old Testament. We don't know exactly what Old Testament saints knew about life after death. But there's many indications that they didn't have a lot of information. But they could look at this verse that says, God's love is from everlasting to everlasting. It lasts forever. But God's covenant love, a covenant has to have an object. A covenant is made with somebody. God makes a covenant with His people. So when He says from everlasting to everlasting, that gives us insurance of everlasting life. Those who fear God, those who reverently follow Him, will continue to leave to receive His loving kindness forever. Our time on earth is short, but eternity is forever. And what a wonderful contrast to the stark reminder of, of how short life is. You know, a child looks forward to adulthood, and finally, it gets there. But soon we find ourselves gray, lagging strength, saying, how did the time pass so quickly? Such thoughts can be very depressing unless, unless we have God's perspective on time and eternity. So we've been promised eternal life, that everyone who trusts in the Lord will live forever. Jesus said to Nicodemus, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In addition to John 3.16, we've been given many, many other assurances of eternal life. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 1 John 2.25 says, and this is the promise that God has given us eternal life. John 14.16 
Jesus said to his disciples in the upper room the night before he was crucified, he said, and I will ask the Father, he'll give you another counselor to be with you forever. That is the hope of the Christian. Life eternal. And we're to live with the certainty of eternity comforting us as we deal with all the challenges of life. Our temporary fading time here on earth. We're to have a pilgrim mentality. Death is simply the door <coughs> to eternal blessing. Life is short. Eternity is forever. One very valuable application to the timelessness of God, that He's eternal, is we've got to learn to trust the speed of God. To trust the speed of God, as one author has put it. 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness. You see, God's time scale is very much different than ours. God time is not the same as human time. God is not restrained by time as we are. God exists in the eternal present. The past, the present, the future, that's all the same to God. Now that's hard to, to wrap your mind around. It's as hard to, to even conceive of what eternity is, that God has existed forever and will exist forever. But God time is not like human time. God's purposes, His timing are often hidden from us. And faith means we wait for His timing <coughs> as He makes everything beautiful in its time. God never gets in a hurry. Even though we do. When we try to Hurry God up. And God would never get in a hurry. God time is not human time. As author John Bloom puts it, when God seems slow to us, we must remember he moves at the speed of his faithfulness to work all things together with good. For good. The speed of his faithfulness. These verses brought to mind a promise regarding our children and grandchildren. The highest goal and desire I have for my children and grandchildren is that they would know the Lord Jesus as Savior and would serve Him forever. That's my daily prayer. But can we as parents and grandparents that such prayers will be, an will be answered? I would love to give you a biblical verse and a promise that your children and your grandchildren will be in heaven with you. But that's not really possible, simply because each person must make an individual decision to follow Christ as Savior. But what we can do is to live godly and righteous lives as examples creating an environment in which encourages the development of faith. It's like in gardening. You create an environment, you do the, the, the soil work and the preparation and you, and you plant the seeds and you water the seeds and you put the, the garden in a, uh, a position or you build the garden in a position where it can, it can receive the right amount of sunlight and, and then you, you pull the weeds and you do all those things. And then that creates the environment in which a plant can grow and flourish. And as parents, we do the same thing. We create an environment in which faith can flourish. We surround our children with godly friends, with godly influences. We watch out for the weeds that come up in, in our culture. And there are a lot of cultural weeds out there that we have to be diligent to pull. Our lifestyle is very important. As a rule, godly parents will raise godly children. 
although not always. Look at verses 17 and 18 with children and grandchildren in mind. But the loving kindness of the Lord is for everlasting to everlasting on those who fear Him and His righteousness to children's children, to those who keep His covenant and remember His precepts to do them. What are these verses promising? I think it says that if we live fearing God, fear being rightly understood as awesome respect and submission and obedience if we live obedient to his word, serving faithfully, that will lead to the blessings of righteousness to our children and our children's children, our grandchildren. Our lifestyle of righteous living will have an effect, a strong effect, not only on our generation, but on the next generation and even the next generations. They'll be more likely to follow in our footsteps of faith. And if I could offer an observation from many years of ministry. Boys follow their dads and girls follow their moms in respect to <coughs> spirituality. If a dad has little interest in spiritual things, his sons will probably not have any more interest than he did. Girls will follow their moms. But if we can look around, just think of families that you know where the dad is not interested in spiritual things. Think of the sons. And you'll realize the truth of what I'm saying. <coughs> but if both parents are Christ followers, their children will usually be Christ followers too. If we as parents love and serve Christ in the church, our children would usually follow our example. Now this is generally true and exceptions exist. There are prodigals. But to live godly is what God requires of parents. And part of godly living is to teach, both formally and informally. Listen to what Deuteronomy 6, 4-7 says. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And these words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your sons. You shall talk to them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. The Jews took those things literally. They would they would have little phylacteries, they called them. They put on the forehead and on their arms. But what God is saying is that it should be visible in our lives. Our lifestyle should be godly lifestyles. And the people would be able to observe that, just as they would if you had something fastened to your arm or to your forehead. Diligently teach and live. And if we do so, greater are the chances that our children will follow the Lord and they'll pass it on to your grandchildren, our children's children. Each person, again, must individually choose that we can create an environment in which faith can flourish. The absolute best and most thing we can do for our children is to live godly lives. That's the very best thing you can do for your children, your grandchildren. This entire psalm calls us to bless and praise the Lord. It begins and it ends with a call to praise. And we praise God, who is fully and sovereignly in control. Go back to Psalm 103. In verse 19. The Lord has established His throne in the heavens and His sovereignty rules over all. Not part, all. Our eternal God rules over the entire universe from His throne in heaven. His plan for the ages is working itself out. 
And we've been given a few glimpses into the magnificent throne room of heaven. Isaiah speaks of seeing God on his throne in Isaiah 6. He said, In the year of the king, Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, exalted with the train of his robe, filling the temple. The Apostle John gives us a view in Revelation. In verse chapter 4 and verse 6. Verses 1 through 6. And this is John giving, giving a glimpse into heaven. Just try to imagine what this was. And after these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. In the first verse, first voice which I had heard like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me he said come up here and I'll show you what must take place after these things immediately I was in the spirit behold a throne was standing in heaven and one was sitting on the throne and he was who was sitting was like a jasper stone and a sardis in appearance and there was a rainbow around the throne and in, like an emerald in appearance and around the throne were 24 thrones, and upon the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white garments and golden crowns on their heads. And out of the throne, out from the throne come flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center and around the throne, four living creatures, full of eyes front and behind. And these four living creatures were crying out constantly, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. The eternality of God being praised there. A wonderful peek into the throne room of heaven. And that's what people see if they die in Christ. And that's why, as Christians, we don't fear death. In fact, it's something to look forward to. It's just the door into eternity. These things should move us to humbly bow in reverence, awe, and submission to God. Because God rules in the affairs of men and nature, nations and what God does is always right and good. Although we might not understand what He is doing. Psalm 115.3 says this, Our God is in the heaven. He does whatever He pleases. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever He pleases. God is sovereign. God is in control. We don't always understand. We don't always see His hand. But when we don't see His hand, we trust His heart. Daniel 4, 35 records the words of a humble king of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar. And he said this, His dominion is an everlasting dominion his kingdom endures from generation to generations, and all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. That's something from the greatest king on earth at that time. But he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of earth, and no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? No one has the authority over God. So what's the extent of God's reign? It extends from the highest angels. That's to, we kind of understand this. He talks about the highest angels and then in angels. He says in verse 20, Bless the Lord, you his angels, mighty in strength to perform his word, obeying the word, voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, who serve him, doing his will. And many have said that he's talking in first of verse 20 about the archangels. Two of them we know the names, Michael and Gabriel. 
But then the lesser ranks of angels are also called to praise the Lord in verse 21. And then all creation. Bless the Lord all you works of His in all the places of His dominion. And he ends with bless the Lord for my soul. This psalm begins and ends with a call to bless and to praise the Lord. Almighty God has given us the ability to live good, productive, and pleasant lives on earth by His definition. He's revealed Himself to us and gifted us with salvation. And even though our lives pass so quickly, because of God's loving kindness, we have the opportunity to live in heaven forever if we accept His gift of salvation. What well, wonderful reasons God has given us to praise and bless the Lord and to live godly lives in gratitude and lives of praise. I read something this morning that said the highest activity on earth is to praise God, to recognize who God is, and to say, thank you, God. You are magnificent. Shall we pray together? Father, you are almighty God. You are high and lifted up. You are above our understanding. But Father, you have stooped down to offer salvation. And you have revealed yourself to us. You've not kept us in the dark. Father, you've given us your word. You've given us uh, your spirit within us. Thank you, Father. Thank you that we have the opportunity to praise you. To be able to walk with you. To receive your guidance and your spirit that dwells with us. And as Jesus said, I will be with you forever even to the end of the age. Father, we thank you for that. We praise you. You are worthy of all of our praise, all of our honor, all of our gratitude. And we thank you. Father, thank you for this song. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. And Father, may we not forget all of your great gifts you've given us. And we thank you in Jesus' name, the greatest gift of all, our salvation. Amen. Thank you.